Good morning and welcome to the 30th and final meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. I'd like to welcome Angela Constance to the meeting, who is attending in place of Alec Neil, who sends his apologies. Can I ask everyone in the public gallery to please switch off their electronic devices or turn them to silent? Item 1 is decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items 4, 5 and 6 in private this morning? Thank you. Item two is the section 22 reports, the 2017-18 audits of NHS Highland financial sustainability and NHS Ayrshire and Arran financial sustainability. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning. John Burns, the Chief Executive of NHS Ayrshire and Arran and Professor Elaine Mead, Chief Executive of NHS Highland. Both of our witnesses this morning are going to make opening statements and I'd like to ask Professor Elaine Mead to go first. Thank you, convener and members, for inviting me here today to give evidence to the committee regarding the 2017-18 audit of NHS Highland financial sustainability. As you're aware, NHS Highland is currently not financially stable and I would like to take a few moments to outline the reasons for this position. There's an increasing challenge in balancing the three areas outlined by the Auditor General, namely finance, waiting times and the quality of care. In NHS Highland, we've continued to ensure a clear focus on the quality and safety of care, including adult social care, through our Highland quality approach, whilst maintaining key waiting times for patients, which has been to the detriment of our ability to maintain financial balance in 2017-18. There are significant challenges which are specific to the delivery of care in remote and rural areas and island populations, which without doubt are complex and more costly due to the significant distances. Covering 41% of the most remote and rural geography of Scotland with an ageing population, it has been more challenging every year for NHS Highland to be able to sustain the historical models of care within budget due in part to our inability to recruit key members of staff. Our focus has been on ensuring that we can provide an appropriate and timely response to keep people safe, both in and out of hours, but this has come at a significant cost. As a board, we are committed to the reduction of waste in the system and the transformation of services to ensure that we have sustainable and integrated care fit for future generations for the people of the Highlands. In order to do this, we must change. This change inevitably takes time, but we've already embarked on that journey, and I would like to thank our outstanding staff for their continued efforts. I'll be very happy today to do my best to answer any questions from the committee. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much indeed. John Burns. Thank you, convener. Um, the 17 audit, uh, 1718 audit uh, of NHS Air Shulan Arms set out in its summary that uh, we needed to address both efficiency and transformation uh, to tackle the challenges that we face in Ayrshire and Arden. In the submission we've made to the committee for uh, this evidence session, uh, we've set out in the document our approach to looking at this across the whole system in Ayrshire and Arden, uh, across integrated health and care planning. Our 10-year strategy is called Caring for Ayrshire, uh, it's a plan that will be delivered through uh, our transformation programme. And that transformation programme uh, will underpin the reform that we believe is needed to our model of care and strive to deliver the right care in the right place uh, in a system that has the right balance between acute service provision and community provision. As well as the transformational programme, we also recognise, as the uh, audit report uh, set out, that we need to have strong operational grip in terms of our day-to-day -day management uh, and, and in doing this to also ensure that we provide our services in, at best value as well as with the right safety and quality. This is a significant programme of work that we're undertaking and to ensure focus we've established a robust operational governance uh, and programme management arrangement. We have a delivery plan in development for the next three years that will address our performance, 
service delivery, service change and redesign, as well as bringing together the impacts on workforce, infrastructure and pulling this through into the three-year revenue plan. Uh, I believe the work that we're doing is building a strong foundation for that three-year plan. Uh, and finally, convener, I would like to reflect the hard work of the teams across Ayrshire and Arne in committing to the work that we uh, require to do, but also to our partners uh, who will play an important part in delivering the reform that we need in Ayrshire and Arne. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Burns. I'm going to ask Colin Beattie to open questioning for the committee. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a, a question for Ayrshire and Arne. Um, your submission describes the uh, effective prescribing programme and specifically your resp respiratory uh, prescribing to care work and the improvements that have been brought about by this initiative in the short term. What are the clear long-term outcomes against which that initiative will actually be measured? Yeah. Um, the work in respiratory is a, uh, is a, a programme uh, looking at uh, the pathway, end to end pathway for respiratory care. And within that, we've looked at the impact of prescribing. Ayrshire and Arne uh, was in uh, benchmark one of the higher uh, cost prescribers in respiratory medicines. And we have taken a, a view uh, that the, the best way to change is to uh, look at how we transform uh, with our uh, clinical teams um, and deliver services differently. Um, in terms of respiratory pathway, um, we've specifically uh, focused in on how we uh, affect change to prescribing, particularly around uh, inhalers, um, and move some money into uh, community-based pulmonary rehab and also into uh, specialist nursing. So taking some uh, reinvestment from prescribing to other services that are evidenced uh, to be highly effective. I mean, you've highlighted that the, the cost seems to be highest in terms of the steroid inhalers. Uh, um, uh, how, how do you actually reduce the use of these when presumably people are dependent on them? Well, I think that what we've done is we've worked with our respiratory team and we've worked with uh, our primary care teams, with our pharmacists and others to look at uh, the... Uh, the, 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 uh, the care pathway and where medicines can effectively and properly uh, uh, be used. Uh, within that, we've recognised that uh, by investing in areas like pulmonary rehabilitation, uh, investing in specialist nurses, we can provide support for patients that improves and enhances their quality of life, whilst at the same time reducing the level of prescribing uh, and uh, uh, reducing the, the spend on prescribing and moving some of that money to that investment where uh, there is an evidence that it has a positive impact. And the early indications that we are seeing from our work is that uh, patients like it uh, and that it has reduced uh, the number of admissions, uh, unscheduled care admissions to hospital, uh, and the, for those that do need to be admitted, it's reduced their length of stay. So it's had a very positive impact on the outcome uh, for patients. Has there been any negative impact? Uh, there hasn't been, no. No. Okay. Perhaps I can ask a question for NHS Highlands. Uh, in your submission, you talk about uh, uh, redesigning modules of care and so forth. But you say that the new modules will be more sustainable, but they have proven to be very difficult to consult and agree. Even where there has been consensus through public consultation, decisions have come under constant public and political challenges. Not surprisingly, the pace of change has been very, low, very slow. Can you give some examples of public and political challenges that you've uh, encountered? Yes, indeed, and, and we continue to consult on any of the changes that we'd like to make, but um, clearly a number of these services are very precious to local people. And Sky may be an example of where we had looked at the out-of-hours um, services and how could we reconfigure those services to give us the best 
possible value um, to meet the needs of, of the paper, uh, people. And as I said in my introduction, the important thing for us is to make sure services are safe for the people. As we've redesigned services in Sky and looked at the Sky services, um, the local population have, have not felt safe and have said that they were concerned about any reduction in the level of care that was being provided. But there's a significant cost to um, how we provide out of hours. So, for example, costs in West Ross could be cost per case as, as high as £1,400. Whereas in an Inverness practice, you'll find that out of hours costs could just be £70 per cost per case. So, whilst this must be driven on access and safety, there's a cost element, and we need to make sure that we can provide the best care for people 24 7. The opposition that we've had then is because people don't always understand about emergency care and feel that the out of hours care, which is provided primarily as primary care for GPs is the same as emergency care, which is a 999 response. And that's where we need to communicate better, engage much more with politicians and local people to make absolutely sure that they understand by changing the out of hour service that actually wasn't having an impact on the emergency care services that we were providing for them. So the example you're giving in Sky is that there has been a public kickback against Indeed. the proposals to change. Indeed. Um, and we've involved local people, local politicians. We've had Sir Lewis Ritchie join us on that with that work. And actually, we're making some progress now. But there is an additional cost to any of the changes that we've wanted to make. Now, you've mentioned political challenges as well as the, the public. Indeed. What political challenges have you, have you had? So we've had political challenges at all levels, at a local level, for local members providing support to their constituents, but, but also party members um, bringing forward concerns of their local constituents. Understandably, as people are concerned, right across our patch on changes that we're attempting to make. So most recently, in Case Ness, we've had a public consultation it's been wide ranging and that's been over a number of years as politicians uh, local politicians and the public have asked us about why we're needing to make the changes and the reason we need to make changes is because the current models of care are simply not sustainable in their current form but in my experience the first thing you do when you're suggesting fairly radical changes is you get the local politicians fully briefed and understanding the reasons Indeed. behind it and get and get them to get behind the whole thing. Indeed. That doesn't seem to have happened from what you're saying. We we could have done better, but we have made every attempt on a regular basis to meet with and brief local politicians. Um, clearly we have now the full support in Case Ness of, of all members of the local authority, which is a motion passed last week. So it takes time to go through that conversation, to share the evidence, to help people understand all parts of the um, jigsaw in a local area that lead us to need to make a change. And I think it's the time, Mr Beatty, that is the issue for us. We need to really spend a lot of time explaining the need for change and why the current models of care are no longer sustainable. Do you think that the current uh, type and level of communication that you've got with public and politicians is adequate? We can always do better. We always reflect on how we're engaging. Um, we do re meet regularly with our MSP colleagues and MP colleagues, but we also meet with our council colleagues locally, both with Highland Council and, and Argyle and Butte. Do you think that, uh, obviously, your changes have got to be open to public scrutiny? Indeed. Do you think that uh, it's worth revisiting how you're approaching this? Because clearly, from what you're saying, your, 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 your whole project here is being slowed down, the mo these modules are being slowed down, and everything's coming under public and political challenges, then clearly you're not going to achieve your targets within a, a reasonable time. No, and that's the difficulty that I think many, many boards face, but particularly in our own area where we have 
a need to change the models in remote and rural areas. We see right across our whole patch from Campbelltown right through to Wick that we have changes we need to make and we need to engage in all of those areas in, with all of those communities. But for us, just as an example, it would take us two and a half hours to drive just to have a conversation in Wick, which is something that is timely, but takes a huge amount of the local team's time to continually engage. We can't make changes without engagement, and we understand and accept that, and, and we will continue to do our best to engage with, with the local people. Thank you. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much. Uh, my questions are for Ayrshire and Aaron. Good morning, John. Uh, firstly, I'd like to echo the comments that you made yourself to pay tribute to the great work that's been done by the staff throughout Arm, NHS, and in particular Chris House that I know very well. Uh, but the Auditor General uh, has, has written some fairly detailed reports on this and over the uh, recent years, um, principally concerns about the brokerage and overspend that Arm has been showing. Uh, she also highlights a lack of attention to detailed financial planning and the consequent impact this is all having on performance and ultimately says she's finding it difficult to see how the board can get in balance in, in coming years. Could I just ask you initially, to how do you respond to these findings in the round? I think that um, we started this journey in 1617. Uh, we recognised we needed to do more than just deliver an efficiency programme, as I've referred to in my opening statement. Uh, we have been developing uh, that uh, a new approach uh, to uh, deliver transformational change whilst delivering uh, the operational grip that's necessary. Uh, we have, in the last 18 months, made significant changes uh, to our approach. Uh, we have a, a much uh, tighter uh, operational scrutiny programme. Uh, we have uh, a very detailed uh, programme management where every programme, every efficiency is tracked uh, and uh, um, is reviewed uh, regularly for progress and delivery. Uh, and we've introduced clear accountability uh, for each and every programme. Um, and we're now seeing uh, uh, change deliver. And in year, uh, we review matters through uh, a, a financial control schedule so that we are clear about how we're delivering what we're delivering, and if something isn't delivering, uh, the, uh, the scrutiny and interventions that we need to take. Mm -hmm. So I believe that we have moved on significantly and have a strong position on which we're building forward. Mm. Can I ask, is there anything that you think is peculiar about Isher and Aaron, and I mean the funding model? Uh, it's been widely reported that you've overspent considerably. And I, for one, at this committee have said, well, you're spending money on healthcare needs that <coughs> people the population actually have. <coughs> So there's an argument and a discussion to be had there, but what's your view? Is the funding formula correctly reflecting the health needs of the Ayrshire and population? Or should there be some thought being applied to, to adjusting and revisiting that to, to, to fairly award what Ayrshire and Aaron perhaps needs to, to deliver that health care? Well, I think we recognise that the funding formula is, uh, is, is, is the same for all boards in Scotland. So we need to uh, work within that, that, that formula. Um, what I think we have uh, recognised is that we need to uh, change the balance in our health and care system in Ayrshire and Arne. Um, there has been, uh, I think, an over-reliance on acute hospitals. And what we are doing with our health and social care partnerships together is looking to develop the right balance of that service. So, for example, um, uh, we have uh, uh, recently introduced a significant investment into intermediate care and community rehabilitation across all three partnerships uh, to support patients uh, coming out of hospital, but also to uh, uh, where patients don't need to be admitted to provide additional support for them in the community. And we believe that that, again, there's a strong evidence base for this work, and we believe that is already bringing change uh, to the, uh, the use of unscheduled care beds. So we're seeing quite a lot of change and transformation. We do, however, recognise that we've got uh, some real challenges in terms of our population health. Uh, right across uh, Ayrshire and Arne. And again, uh, we are looking to uh, 
uh, ensure that we are providing our services in a way that uh, supports patients to take ownership uh, of, of their own health and well-being where that's appropriate um, and looking to uh, uh, use uh, digital technology and, and, and other examples of technology to provide some of that and where that works and it's in very uh, early stages it works well uh, we need to I think scale uh, that further um, so we need to continue to look at the reform agenda in Ayrshire and Arne, uh, to get the right balance but what are the, you mentioned a couple of key areas there uh, unfunded beds and so on but what are the key areas for you in Ayrshire and Arne? that are going to help you to get control of the finances in, in, in the coming years? Is it workforce? Is it prescribing? Is it agency? Is it, the unfair, is it all of this? And how are you making progress in, in turning it around? So it's all of these factors. Uh, I think that in terms of prescribing, uh, we are making very good progress. We have uh, excellent working with our primary care teams in prescribing. And indeed, this year, we will exceed our target. Uh, likewise, in, in hospital, we set uh, an ambitious target for hospital prescribing changes and we'll slightly exceed that based on forecast at this time. There's no doubt workforce is a challenge and we're very clear that we need to be a board that can attract staff and also retain staff, particularly medical staff in, in, in uh, areas where there are the skills are scarce. We have a, a, a record of being able to recruit staff, but there are some hard to fill posts. That does necessitate uh, uh, locum spend for doctors to maintain services. So we need to, to continue to look at how we redesign our services to make them sustainable uh, because if we can't get the medical workforce we need to uh, look at the workforce model that supports that service. We also need to look regionally and how we work with our colleagues for some of these solutions and already uh, as, as you know we have examples of where that works very well where Ayrshire partners with other boards and the pathway back to Ayrshire is effective. Could you just tell us, what, what do you think, John, out with your control? I know you rely on working with partners. You've got three uh, boards there, north, basically North East and, and South Ayrshire involved, who are presumably all running at different speeds and at a different pace. Could you just outline for the committee, what, what kind of factors do you rely on that you don't control in order to deliver the successful transformation strategy that we seek? Well, I think the... the uh, as we look forward, because much of it we can manage uh, within health and care, uh, and, and the strength of our partnership is important there. You're right, it is, there are different paces and the three are different, but we do work well together. Um, I think the, 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 the biggest change is how we, uh, and, and indeed Elaine referred to it in, in our earlier responses, uh, making sure we've got the right communication with our communities about change. We need to make sure, and we are certainly, as, as uh, clearly uh, Elaine has highlighted, uh, we, are, we are looking to work uh, and, and uh, engage with our communities in terms of that need for change and why it's important and, why it will, and, and what it will give our communities. Not what it will take away, but what it will give our communities in terms of sustainable services with the expertise when you need Burns, it. For, forgive me, but the communication is within your control. I think Mr Coffey asked you what factors were not within your control. Well, I think the, the factors that aren't within our control, um, you know, if, 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 the, if, if we can't get the workforce, then that's not something that we have a direct control over. Um, uh, so we work with, uh, uh, you know, obviously NHS Education Scotland in terms of training uh, posts. But I do think that, that we need to uh, work uh, with our communities um, because I accept the communication is in our control, absolutely. But I think that, that then that ability to influence and impact change um, sometimes requires that control to be shared with our communities so that it's, 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 it's not just us, we, we're moving forward together. Okay. And what, what I meant convening about that was that the, the pace of change in the three councils, for example, in terms of health and social care yeah. and discharges, say, from Crosshouse, you, you don't really have full control over that. It's, you're working very well with partners and so on, but there's a different pace there, as I understand it from previous discussions with you. What, what, what can we do, what can we do to help you to move that along a bit faster, quicker, so that all three councils perhaps are operating at the same pace and assisting with this whole health and social care integration agenda that we, we, we hope is going to be successful? I think all three in Ayrshire are. 
Um, I think that um, we are uh, we recognise that, that they, they they do work and, and are in different places, and some of that is because their reform within social care is at a different place. And one of the things that that we I think should and could encourage is uh, the sharing of best practice um, across um, uh, systems, health and social care. My last question for now, Jenny, please. Uh, Mr Coffey. Uh, well, you're projecting an additional overspend of £13 million for 2019-20, but we do know from this budget that you've been allocated an extra £25 million. Pounds. Can you say, can you assure the committee that that you will get the budget on balance in the, the coming years, as you've, 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 I think you've stated in prior papers, but are you confident that you can achieve that in the immediate years to come? I'm confident we're doing everything we possibly can to achieve that, uh, and that is absolutely uh, our intent. We're very clear from the Cabinet Secretary's position in terms of three-year uh, you know, planning our revenue over a three-year basis, hence the three-year plan we're developing, and we're very clear that we need to, to deliver a balanced Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Very briefly, if I may, Mr Burns, none of these issues that we're hearing about are unique uh, or indeed new. Um, can you just help me out to understand why, why was this planning, this transformation, not started earlier? Uh, and perhaps is that, did the Scottish Government never pick up on any of the issues coming down the line through monitoring? Mr Burns. I think that um, we recognised, as I said, in 1617, that the level of change and the pace of change that we had in Ayrshire and Arden wasn't sufficient, that we needed to uh, look uh, uh, more widely uh, at uh, transformation, because uh, we were seeing financial pressures at that point. 1617 was the first year where we felt uh, we'd been able to balance our books and deliver efficiencies um, over many, many years. And 1617 was the first year where we saw that difficulty. Um, and we worked, uh, uh, to, we started our work at that point to, uh, to develop the programme we have today. Mm -hmm. And ask Arbor. I'm, I'm going to come to the workforce challenges in just a second. I just wanted to pick up on where, where Colin Beattie left off. Uh, Professor Mead, you, you said the current model of care is not sustainable. Um, I think we, we all probably ag agree with that. I suppose the question is, is it not sustainable one, because of budgetary pressures and the need to make efficiency savings and cuts? Um, is it not sustainable because we have workforce pressures and we simply don't have the staff to deliver the service um, in a sustainable way? Or three, is it because there have been so much advances in, in medicine and medical technology that it's simply not the right thing to keep the model as it is and that's why we need a transformation? Which, which one of the three is it? I believe it is all three. And I think that's the combination that we are all uh, challenged by and are here to celebrate. There have been such fantastic innovation and progress in, in medical technologies over the year. We are keeping people alive longer and therefore their requirements and their needs are more extensive. So, so the innovation, the technology, the new drugs, just in NHS Highland, we've had a 35% increase in the cost of hospital acute drugs in the last five years. We, we need to give those drugs to our patients. So, so taking the Sky example, yeah. if we had the budget and we had the GPs, would you still want to reduce out of our services in Sky? I think we would want to look at best value always and make absolutely sure that was the right model. We are not looking to change the models because of money. We're actually not able to recruit the GPs. So, so in Highland particularly, and maybe as a barometer of some of the changes in the rest of Scotland, we see most acutely the pressures due to the lack of being able to recruit staff. And therefore, there's a, a, a need to make... Um, the, the public understand that we can't have everything in the way we've always had it. So we want to be able to reconfigure things that are really not best value and not necessary whilst maintaining safe services. And we will never compromise on the safety of our services. So, so just to clarify, if there was adequate GPs and there was adequate funding, 
we wouldn't be a reduction of out of our services in Sky. We would still be wanting to have a conversation about is that the right thing to do with the resources that we have available. We have other pressures across the whole system. So the innovations, the costs of drug, we, we've had a, an increase of 55% in just the uh, requirement for imaging, CT and MRI, for example, um, in our radiology services. So all of these things add up to additional costs. Is it something that we wish to continue to invest in? Are we getting best value for that? What are the needs of the local community? And I think it's a conversation that we need to have more widely with the public to understand exactly what the needs are going forward. A huge vacancy rate among, amongst radiologists huge, and radiographers, which is, which is a huge challenge across, across um, the country. A major problem. And for NHS Highland, we have 36 consultant vacancies currently, 13% vacancies. All of those positions at the moment would need to be covered. That in, in return gives us a £15 million cost in locums while we're continuing to provide the same models of care. We, we've been looking to change those models over time for a, for a number of years now. All boards are doing that. And of those consultant vacancies you have, what proportion are you advertising as 8-2 contracts and 9-1 contracts and what impact so, that's having so on the we, group? So we've um, moved to being able to be very flexible with our contracts with colleagues now. So we will allow uh, conversations. In fact, we're looking not just to recruit um, to individual posts, but we're looking to recruit families, partners to join us. We're doing everything we possibly can, and it's not because NHS Highland is not a fantastic place to come and work and practice. As you've already outlined, there are simply not enough consultants yeah. in ma many specialties. Um, is that the same in your Sharon Adam, around the 8291 contracts as the, the BME? I make it very clear that there's one of the big frustrations in terms of trying to attract consultants to come to Scotland compared to other parts of the UK has been the 8291 issue as well as a whole range of other issues, but that being a key factor. Um, I, I, I think we've moved away. In fact, I know we've moved away from uh, the 91 position. Um, I think the, 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 the issue is good job planning, whether it's 8291, whatever. It's making sure you've got the right job plan uh, for that service, for that consultant team as part of that team that reflects all of the work that a consultant does, which is not just the direct clinical care that they offer. John, what I found really interesting from uh, your earlier answer to, to Mr Coffey around what is um, not in your control and, and the one that you picked was around workforce planning. Um, and obviously the way workforce planning is currently being, I mean, it's currently being redesigned. We're waiting for a comprehensive workforce plan that will be um, published at the start of next year. Is tr trying to make a national strategy. How much connection do you think there is between the health boards around coming together for a comprehensive workforce strategy? And how is that gap and not having that comprehensive workforce strategy impacting on your service delivery in your own health boards? So we, we have our own workforce plan and, and workforce strategy, and uh, I'm sure all my colleague boards have one as well. Um, we are looking, uh, and I can only speak for the West, but we are looking at workforce planning uh, across the West of Scotland as part of the regional working uh, that, that we have underway, because we think that uh, it's important that we can identify and indeed support new roles uh, uh, beyond a single board. Uh, so, so there's important work going on regionally, and then that will connect nationally, uh, because that's then connects into training programmes and, and training need. So, I think when it's when I say it's out with our control, uh, the ability to you know to, 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 to do the training numbers is is not something we control, but we can control our workforce plan and we can control how we redesign our workforce around a, a much more of a multidisciplinary team approach. Uh, which I think is the way forward. And in terms of, if you connect the two around the service reform that needs to take place in, in terms of making it financially sustainable as well as sustainable for, for patients in terms of a sustainable service and in terms of the workforce challenges, do you think there is a gap in terms of, would it help you as local health boards if there was a national strategy and a national intention from, from government, from all political parties around Let's be honest with the public around, we're not going to find five, we're not going to magic 5,000 people to fill the vacancies around nurses and consultants and GPs. We're not going to magically find, find the money. Um, and if we want to make it sustainable, we do need a programme of reform across Scotland, and that involves all health boards. If there was that national intention and that national message from the government and all political parties, would that help that local engagement that you need to have and that the ability to persuade local people about the service changes that are taking place in your individual health boards? 
I, I think there's no doubt that, that uh, a common message across Scotland around reform and the need for change, that's a positive message about delivering safe, sustainable, high-quality care for the future would be an important part of uh, how we can all move uh, uh, quite difficult agendas forward. Yes. And do you think that's missing just now? I think we could do more of it, yes. So you'd like some, some leadership on that in terms of from this place, from this parliament? Yes, I think I think it would be I think be a very positive thing if we had a uh, a common view on the need for reform and the importance of that reform. Excellent. And, and moving on to uh, the issue around the culture, uh, when you speak to NHS staff, uh, they're clearly under more pressure than they've ever been before. They clearly feel there's not enough of them, and that just adds to the workload, adds to the pressure. Uh, they think that leads to a fear around what might happen in terms of the delivery of care that they do for their patients increases the risk of um, clinical errors um, or indeed the perception of a clinical um, error. And on top of that, there is now a growing feeling from sorry. right across health boards, sorry, around a culture of, of bullying and intimidation and a lack of a genuine whistleblowing process. I know Highlands has had some particular issues around that. Can you address that issue directly around the culture of intimidation, bullying and the lack of, it seems, a robust whistleblowing process? From an Ayrshire and Arden standpoint, uh, we're very open. We, the, the whistleblowing process is, is uh, um, shared across uh, our organisation, so staff uh, are aware of it. Uh, we also have worked very hard on culture and values in the organisation uh, and worked to engage staff uh, uh, on, on change. Uh, we don't get it right all the time. We can always do better, um, but uh, I think we, we've got a strong foundation in Ayrshire and Arden. In Highland, I, I would agree that honesty and local engagement is absolutely critical going forward. Staff are very tired. They're often uh, working in pressured circumstances. But I also am optimistic because staff are very keen to change. And I think that um, support to be able to change, to have a conversation about why we need to change, will be helpful for frontline staff. Professor Mead, you said in your in your answer to, to Mr Sarwar that there was a 50% increase in CT and MRI. Why is that? The technology now has improved um, that allows imaging to show more diagnostic uh, benefits. So we find that clinicians are continually now asking for the new, newest technologies, the newest tests, and these imaging machines, the CTs and the MRIs, are now becoming invaluable in, in diagnosis. So, so your diagnosis rates have gone up? Ab absolutely. So mm -hmm. the, the tools and the techniques that people are using to make better diagnosis <laughs> is increasing. And again, as I say, that's to be welcomed. But that added to the point Mr. Sam has already made, that the lack of radiologists who need to read these images puts huge pressure on the department. Have the, um, has the diagnosis rate gone up 50% to match the expenditure on CT and MRI? I can't tell you um, and wouldn't be able to tie those two things directly together because it may well be that you're using just a different tool, a different imaging technique to be able to make a similar diagnosis. So I don't think there's a correlation between an increase in CT and MRI and an increase in the number of diagnoses. They'll just be using it to diagnose in a different way. But, I mean, these are clinical decisions, but Indeed. CT and MRI are hugely expensive. How much is an MRI scan? I'm afraid I can't tell you exactly, but we can find the information for you. So okay. My uh, understanding is it's, it is quite a lot of money. I mean, it runs into thousands. Indeed, so. and, and the cost of and the time it takes to report many hundreds of slices of those images is, is significant. I mean, do you think there are health economists in the Scottish government that, that can marry these figures up? There must be. There, there must be, and I'd welcome that. Okay. Can I ask you about the cost of locums in Indeed. NHS Highland? I think this is probably a question you anticipated, as the, it is the committee has um, looked at this when we took evidence from the Auditor General on her report on your health board. And you very helpfully, in your um, submission, provided a breakdown of costs. So thank you very much for that. Um, if I'm reading your table correctly, the total pay costs for two locum doctors in your health board runs to over £900,000. Is that an effective use of taxpayers' money? It, it is 
stark. Um, that's why we've wanted to put this information into the public domain in the way that we have, because this is um, a good use of taxpayers' <coughs> money, I would say, Ms. Mara, because we need to provide a sustainable <coughs> service in this particular hospital. This is a rural general hospital where we need to have 24-7 response to emergency care. They need to be expert in that care and they need to be able to address anything that may come into a rural general hospital. So not having a, a, an appropriate senior level response is simply not an option for us. These are geographically important to Scottish Ambulance and for the patients that we provide the care for. What is stark in the table and nearly over £900,000 for these two individuals is because we've actually managed to secure people who have wanted to come back on a regular basis and therefore have been paid and shown us two individual uh, costs for two locums who have continually come back. And that helps the team by having the same people coming into that team on a regular weekend basis <coughs> than what we might have not shown as such high cost by 10 people coming in 10 times would have been the same cost, yeah. but we wouldn't have had the continuity of care. Mm -hmm. So I hope that tries to explain why, whether we would have had two locums or 10 locums, we will still have had to pay the same amount of money. It is just in this case, we've secured two locums who've continually come back. I understand the reasoning sure. around it and, um, I think agree with your decision that these hospitals must be staffed with mm -hmm. people who, who can, can do the job and that is the right thing. But as a countable officer for NHS Highland, you must be tearing your hair out when you, you're approaching the end of the year and you're looking at your books and finding that you've had to pay nearly a million pounds for, for two doctors. What is the what is the process that that leads you to this situation that you have to pay out nearly a million pounds of taxpayers money just for two doctors and what would prevent that situation so we don't just address that at the end of the year it's something that we look at throughout the year the medical director is tasked to oversee the cost of medical locums and i take his professional advice on a weekly basis about what is appropriate clinical care and cover to these various hospitals. But sorry, I think my question is, what would prevent you having to make this hugely expensive decision? It, it is quite simple to be able to recruit permanent, high calibre medical staff into these roles. And we are continually trying to do that in all of these rural general hospitals. And what is your obstacle to that? Are we not training enough doctors? The, the role of the specialist generalist if I might describe it as that an individual that would be in a small rural hospital yes. who has to address anything that comes through the door is not a post which is very commonly trained now and not particularly attractive so is that the fault of our workforce planning strategy I, I think it's um, maybe due even further back to some of the training some of the training options and certainly NHS Highland is working very hard to to have junior doctors rotating through our rural general hospitals to make them attractive for them in the future. But these are very challenging roles in rural general hospitals without huge teams of support that you might get in bigger hospitals. Okay, I'm going to take two supplementaries on this point specifically from Liam Kerr and then Anas Sarwar. Yeah, just uh, on, on the locum cost point, mm -hmm. uh, what would be the, 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 the point here is that these two individuals are coming through an agency. So there is a agency cost uh, to that. Why, why aren't they employees? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, presumably you offer them employed jobs. And if so, at what salary? Uh, is it the same as what's on this table? Or actually, are you saying to locums such as these, I, I appreciate this, is, we're focusing on two particular, but it would be throughout the system. Do you say to them, <laughs> look, we'll, we'll offer you an employed position? And they say, no, thank you. We'll come through an agency because an agency gets, let's say, a 10% cut. Uh, plus, we can uh, invoice more. Indeed, Mr. Kerr, that is the situation, that we would always attempt to secure 
in-house locums or permanent staff wherever, first and foremost, but we would try to have internal locums if we possibly could or offer short-term locums. Uh, where we've attempted all of those things and we've still been unable to, to address that issue, we have to go out to the market. We have a very tight way of going out through a, a particular agency to be able to secure individuals. Um, it's not a completely open market but we do then have to secure the cover and often as that gets closer either in a hospital like this or frankly in an out of hours service as it gets closer to the time where we need to have that then the market forces will require us to be able to pay higher than we would pay often as a salary and there are some individuals that will work as locums rather than choose mm. to take a permanent position okay. and our server Professor Mead, this must be infuriating for you, and, and I can completely understand your frustration. I mean, £900,000 for, for two doctors, a couple of almost nine consultants, must be hugely frustrating given the other financial challenges that, that you have. But as you said, it's dictated by the market. So the market is dictating um, what you're having to pay these staff because you have to have those doctors in those um, okay. settings to be able to deliver the care you want to deliver for your patients. What intervention do you think there needs to be from, from government in terms of how this is regulated? Should it be regulated around what an agency can charge? So not capping what you can spend on locums and what you can mm -hmm. spend on agencies because you still have to get the agencies in. But should, there be, should we be looking at capping what an agency can charge for a single shift or what a single nurse or a single doctor can charge for a single shift so there isn't this complete manipulation um, and abuse of health service budgets as a result of the challenges we're facing across the country? It's a conversation that we've had as chief executives many times, I would say, about how can we um, manage that most effectively. And, and we have held a line often with agencies, even together as boards, but there comes a point, and particularly in rural areas where we have a particular need, we would have to say we, we need that doctor today. And therefore, it's very difficult to hold a party line unless you get to the point where you say we will not be able to have patients admitted but, but, but to that, that hospital. But should that party line not be led to left to the chief executives of the health boards, but actually be nationwide, so try and put it in law here from this parliament? Well, in order to balance out that market, then we would see for sure there would be some times when we would say we cannot have a doctor. Okay. And final question, going back to the question about Sky... Local people in Sky, when they see £900,000 spent on two doctors and then think, actually, we can't get our GP out of service in Sky because it costs £1,400 per patient. Can you see their anger, understand their anger in that situation? Indeed, indeed. And I can understand that we have to look at all of these issues as a whole health board. And the people of Sky would not necessarily be looking at what's happening in other parts of Highland. Mm -hmm. Equally, they would also benefit from Sky of having these doctors in their local rural general hospital if they needed that emergency access. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Now, Professor Mead, you said to Anna Sauer earlier on that there were not enough consultants. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in your submission, you say that one of the challenges around that is that there's increasing specialisation in medicine such that consultants are no longer trained in a way that they can work in a generalist setting, such as a rural, rural general hospital. Um, that's highly concerning. So is this something that you've raised with the Scottish government and or the medical training Indeed. facilities? Indeed. And, and what sort of response have you got? So I think uh, we are recognising that now, and certainly the rural colleges are in conversation with, with us and the government about um, how we might want to reconfigure the, the training for the future. Um, certainly we're benefiting, as I've mentioned already, to have, have from having trainees moving through rural general hospitals, but that's, that training of generalism um, is almost moving now uh, in a completely different direction to the super specialism that we've seen in the past. And we're now not benefiting um, in smaller hospitals from having physicians, for example, who can be a respiratory physician or a cardiologist or, or, or there's many things that they can do, but wouldn't necessarily have still maintained the skills to be able to take on a role in a rural general hospital where you have to cover many specialties. Uh, let me just 
be clear, I mean, it, it surprises me that we're in this situation, uh, but let me just pose a direct question. Is the situation being addressed such that there will be these generalists going forward? The colleges are, uh, are discussing that. Um, I can't speak for the actions that they're taking, but we're hopeful that people are beginning to recognise the importance of this generalism role as a specialty in its own right going forward. And certainly in NHS Highland, we've made many representations to try and um, rebalance the, the way that the doctors are trained in the future. Mm -hmm. it might be something to put to NHS shortly. Uh, you, you also, Professor Mead, go on um, to refer to the difficulties in GP vacancies uh, and you suggest that you've developed a number of initiatives and uh, approaches to to address that uh, particular challenge first question begged is can you tell us what they are and the, the approaches and whether they're working yes it, it's more difficult for us to to be able to as as gps are independent contractors to be able to identify and give you an exact number of the vacancies but we still see vacancies in about 12 percent of our practices now the initiatives that we've had to take are um, looking for other members to join the team who are not doctors but could undertake some of the functions that previously the doctors may have um, led on so for example in some of our north coast practices we now have pharmacy practitioners who are working at an advanced level who work as part of the team but take a huge amount of pressure from the doctors and we tried that as a, a trial in the north originally but we're now finding that it is a, possible for us to recruit some pharmacists to be able to give them extended roles to work as part of a team and take significant pressure from the doctors uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So so that's an initiative that we're looking to spread out across NHS Highland. So if we start from a position that says that uh, the initiatives that you've put in are, are working are. To, to address the shortages, how is that knowledge being shared? I mean, for example, is Mr Burns on the phone saying, how are you sorting this out? So we regularly share at the chief executives meetings and we present to each other some of the innovation and some of the things that we've been doing. Um, most of our innovation has been out of immediate need mm -hmm. and some of our needs are more challenging in remote areas than, than others. So uh, we're always happy to share. Uh, I'm just thinking particularly because I would represent North East region and so we would have often very similar mm -hmm. challenges, I would suggest. Uh, and I would be pleased if if NHS Grampian for example were on the phone saying what are you doing that's working is that happening we do have those conversations um, I don't recall we've had a conversation about extended role pharmacists but very happy to share that mm -hmm. thank you mr. Bowman you've been very patient just the information on these particular um, consultants if I understand correctly one of them worked 5188 hours and if, if my maths is correct, that's on average 14 hours a day for 365 days. Every day of the year, they've worked and been paid for 14 hours. So they'll be paid for out of hours as well as in hours. So they'll be paid for um, overnight calls as well. It, and one of the difficulties we've got with locum doctors is they, they are paid even if they are not um, called out. So they'd be available to us and on site often for us to be able to call them. Just seems a very high number there. This is a snapshot of this year. Would this individual have been working the previous year? Are they continuing to work? Um, forgive me, I can't tell you about um, the previous year. We, we may have had other doctors. I can certainly tell you that we've had vacancies in this particular hospital for a number of years. So undoubtedly there would have been similar costs associated with this hospital and maintaining 24-hour cover. So you don't know if this individual has no, got a longer no, term? Would I you be happy if they had? I would ask always that we would be looking to fill the post substantively. That would be the way to reduce these costs. Have substantive positions in these hospitals and then these costs are immediately reduced. Because it's almost like this person, and we don't want to get into specifics, has been working here for a long time and is presumably quite comfortable with 
their so relationship. I understand the point you're making, Mr Bowman, and, and in fact, as I've said, we have the medical director overseeing um, the cost of locums and, and the way that doctors are being used. So he would continually be working with the local practi practitioners to decide whether this is a con important to continue with this position. Professor Mead, I understand that you're looking forward to your retirement, is that correct? Um, thank you. I will be leaving NHS Highland at the end of this year. Um, I'm not retiring. I'm simply moving on to um, two other things. Oh, I see. OK, well, um, I wish you all the best in thank those posts. So Can I ask you um, what progress has been made with the recruitment of a new chief executive? The um, There is a process underway to recruit a, a chief executive. I understand that we've not yet secured a permanent chief executive, but I understand that progress is being made in securing an interim chief executive for NHS Highland. Okay, so you'll have an interim post. And a, per a director of finance? Has there been much progress made with that? So that's under discussion uh, currently. We, we are not out to advert currently for a director of finance. That's currently under discussion. Okay. Do members have any further questions for our witnesses this morning? Willie Coffey. Just, just a brief one. Thanks very much, Convener. Professor Mead, at the beginning you said something about it takes it can take us two and a half hours to go to wherever within the board area for a meeting. Do you know use IT and Skype and stuff to just to have chats and In, meetings? And yes. Why do you need to drive two and a half hours to Well, we, we absolutely do. Um, we're one of the biggest users of Skype and video conferencing. In fact, the NHS near right. me is going to uh, reduce our patients having to travel okay. um, for outpatient appointments. But um, we were talking earlier about the importance of engagement. And you'll know that actually the face-to-face -face engagement is absolutely okay. important. So when we have okay. those public meetings we go in person Great. Thank you. okay any other further points from members okay can i thank you both very much indeed for your evidence this morning we now move to um the next section our next item of business is section 23 report nhs in scotland and i'll just suspend for a couple of minutes to allow these witnesses to take their place thank you
Item three is the Section 23 report, NHS in Scotland 2018. I'd like to welcome our witnesses for this item to the table. Paul Gray, Director General Health and Social Care, Scottish Government, and he's also the Chief Executive of NHS in Scotland. Christine McLaughlin, Director of Health Finance. Shirley Rogers, Director of Health Workforce, and Dr Catherine Calderwood, Chief Medical Officer, all from the Scottish Government. I understand that none of you want to make an opening statement, so I'm going to move directly to questions this morning. Um, I don't know if you were watching, Mr Gray, the uh, evidence we just took on the two Section 22 reports, but there's some very good examples there of some of the problems that the Auditor General touches on in her 2018 overview of the health service, which you're here to give evidence on this morning. Um, we were just discussing some of the costs of locums in NHS Highland. Uh, I think this committee is extremely worried um, because we have a situation in NHS Highland where two locum doctors costs the taxpayer a total of over £900,000. How would you respond to that? Well, I think, it, firstly, I think I would acknowledge the concern. Um, it is a substantial sum of money paid from public funds. Um, and I would ask um, if uh, Shirley Rogers and Catherine Calder would, would say a little to the uh, committee about what we're doing to address these sorts of issues, both through our um, workforce uh, planning and also uh, our approaches to medical staffing, because I agree that these, these costs are, are very substantial indeed. Mr Gray, I mean, this is, this is a big but shocking example, I think, of poor workforce planning in the NHS. We all know we've got issues with, with workforce planning. You have um, admitted that before, but how do we get to the situation where the open market is determining an exorbitant cost of over 900,000 for two doctors to staff our hospitals when the Scottish Government pays for the training of doctors right the way through? How do we get to that situation? Well, there are um, issues of rurality. There are also uh, international shortages of certain specialties. We are not alone in that. But if, if you um, are willing, I can ask colleagues to give you some detail on what we're doing. Charlie Rogers. So um, you're right to identify that there are issues in respect of medical supplies. The DG has said that those are not unique to Scotland. What has the Scottish Government been doing? We've increased significantly the number of places at medical schools. We've introduced, um, for the first time in Scotland, a postgraduate entry medical degree um, this, this autumn just passed, which is particularly targeted around those people who are a little bit more mature and might be interested in working in, in rural and general practice. We're looking at transformed models of patient care, whereby general practitioners are not the only people who can provide healthcare services. So there's a, a combination of both increasing the supply, being as attractive as we can be as an employer, um, within the constraints of all of the um, international challenges that we've talked about, and also looking at a transformed model around how we deliver services. Don't but Ms Rogers, if you allow me to interrupt, it's not just supply, is it? because there are certain parts of the country, and rural areas are an example, but there are, all, there are also areas of deprivation that struggle to get consultants in a wide range of specialities, but also GPs into these areas. So it's not just about supply, it's about getting doctors to the areas that we need them. How are you tackling that? We're tackling that by working very closely with the boards, by trying to make those roles as attractive as they can be, by trying to have a more diverse approach to workforce engagement and employment. We know But it's not working, Ms Rogers, because I went to visit the CAM service in Dundee this summer. They have seven, they're supposed to have seven consultants in ch children and adolescent mental health. They only had four at the time and they couldn't get doctors to come to Dundee to work. And as a result, we only have 41% of children in Tayside getting to see a mental health specialist when they can. So it's clear to me that the government policy isn't working to get these doctors in place. Well, as you'll be aware, for the first time last year, well, this year, we've been able to publish a, a workforce plan that starts to identify where there are particular challenges. We have work through 
um, NHS Education for Scotland and my own team about looking at those shortage areas and what we can do to target in that particular, in that particular regard. We've had examples of using bursaries to try and help in that space. We've had examples of trying to look again at how we particularly provide rural incentives and so on. We bursaries. Have a new, is we that, have a new GMS contract. Is that so bursaries on. to encourage people to train as doctors? That's, that's to encourage people to encourage people to train full stop. That's, that's to encourage people to come and work in our, in our health services. So are you saying we're not training enough doctors? We are training more doctors than we've ever trained before. OK, let me put this to you. We train many doctors in this country. You'll know the figures better than I do. But I hear reports, and I can't get substantiation from the GMC or, or the BMA for this, that we lose up to nearly 40% of our trainee doctors, those that the Scottish Government has paid to train through our universities and hospitals, and they go abroad to Australia and New Zealand. The taxpayer pays for their training, but... In the NHS Highland, we've then got to pay an additional nearly £1 million to get two doctors to cover the hospitals. So why is the Scottish Government paying all this money to train doctors and letting them go to other countries? Should there not be a clause that makes them stay and work in the NHS? There's, a, there's an argument for what you're saying. That, that to, to be fair on the numbers bit, we, we know that young people like to go and explore careers in different parts of the world, and they do that. The vast majority of people who leave Scotland for a medical school go to practice in England and come back, to be fair. So just the fact that people go doesn't mean that some of them don't return, because many of them do. But there are, there are issues about the international marketplace for medicine. They are highly intelligent, highly trained people who have um, skills that are entirely marketable across the world. So in trying to make a career in medicine attractive, we, we try and do all that we can to make that attractive to stay and practice medicine in Scotland, and a, and a large proportion of our medical students do so. OK, let me go back to these two low comes. Have you considered capping the amount of money they can be paid? The, Catherine might be in a better position to talk about the service impacts of that, but we have, we have given consideration to whether or not there are other ways that we can help the boards to manage those situations, whether or not that's around bank, whether it's around agency, whether it's about the, um, the establishment and reinforcement of Scottish arrangements around bank and agency stuff. Catherine Calderwood. So, so we, we know that for doctors in training, we would give locum positions for a limited period of time with the view that those posts then would be filled by somebody in a permanent uh, with a permanent contract that the the doctors that you're discussing I believe uh, one is a surgeon so the essential services that they were providing both emergency and elective work would mean that if that post was empty there would need to be patients traveling one would assume for elective surgery and it would mean that there was potentially a rota that was unsustainable for the other doctors to cover therefore you do risk with with rotas perhaps only three or four people covering that even if one person is that one gap means that the whole service then is very fragile nobody's disputing that they should be there to to, to cover patient need it's the amount that the taxpayer is having to pay should there not be a cap on this? You're letting, the Scottish Government is letting market forces determine how much these doctors will be paid so because they are not taking an NHS contract. In, in, in following up to what uh, Ms Rogers has said, this, this is a marketplace so that if there was a, a job that said we're not going to pay you X amount, th those people would go and, and take a job elsewhere. So they, they would leave that um, that service if, if they could have uh, money or a longer contract somewhere else. But with respect, Dr Calderwood, I don't think the public see our NHS as a marketplace. I think they feel they pay their taxes and their doctors should be on NHS contracts. Why won't the Scottish Government enforce that? I think we're, we, we are, in your point about medical students leaving, I think that we, have, we now understand that a lot better. So we, in Scotland, train a lot more medical students per head of population than the rest of the UK. We have five medical schools. So we, we have always been net exporters of doctors. And, and actually, you'll find Scottish medical students uh, trained doctors all over the world in, in, in very... But is that um, a good thing when we can't staff our own hospitals? So I'm coming to what we're then doing to attract people. So we know that the, the single biggest factor in keeping doctors in Scotland is being trained in a Scottish medical school and where you went to high school. 
So we're doing a lot of work around uh, encouraging uh, medical students from all over Scotland, but in particular in, in remote and rural areas, because we know that people will, they may leave at the early part of their career, but they will come back and establish routes around about where they grew up. Do you up. think if we pay to train doctors, they should be made to sign up to a certain amount of time working for the NHS in Scotland? So this is something that, that has been considered. One of the difficulties for Scotland would be that if, if that was not the case in the rest of the UK, we might find that our Scottish medical schools are less popular. And in fact, that would then have the knock-on effect of not having as many people training here and therefore not staying. Unfortunately, that, that UK marketplace for medical student places would mean if we did something different, we would be disappointed. Advantage. Angela Constance. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, picking up from where uh, Dr Calderwood uh, left off, I'm really interested in the, the, the very practical examples of the things that we're doing now to get out of the, the, the locum loop and address some of the, the, the broader workforce issues. So things like I'm aware of the Refugee uh, Doctor and Dentist programme, uh, where you know for a modest amount of investment, you're able to help people who were doctors in their, their home country um, you know, con convert their qualifications uh, to work in our NHS. Now, I appreciate that issues to do with immigration, etc., and asylum, you know, are, are not in the gift of this Parliament. Um, but we could be doing more there. I'm quite sure. Um, there are issues about, and you touched upon this, and I wonder if you could say more about the whole widening access agenda, because there are high schools up and down this country that have never had any kid uh, go to medical school. Um, and if you could say more about the, the type of work, um, about getting more working class kids at the medical schools, um, and you know, young people uh, from rural areas. Um, and also, if, if you could say more about the upskilling of folk like, uh, you know, any roles, advanced nurse practitioners. So what, what I'm seeking, convener, is can you tell us more about practical things that you're doing now? What are the barriers to doing more of these practical examples, but also what are the opportunities? Um, so I'll take the, the widening participation first. So we have um, a, a targeted number of places for medical students, and, and we must widen this also to other university places, but we're, at, we're specifically studying medical students at the moment, so that each medical school needs to have um, a 10 per year of pupils coming through from schools that would not have, as you've mentioned, ever perhaps had somebody at university or at medical school. So we are, have also got gateway to medicine courses in Scotland. Starting um, last year, Glasgow gateway to medicine course has had 21 out of their 25 um, are going on to medical school. The other four then will do um, paramedical science degrees. So very high success rate of people who've come in from school, schools where they wouldn't get through the medical student exams, but they do a year to prepare them to get into medicine, and that um, has worked extremely well. The, the um, widening participation more generally, going into schools, these schools that you talk about, and the Medical Schools Council has a scheme, so I have been to several schools, in fact I'm going in January again, so many of us and, and colleagues from the NHS are going to talk about careers, not only in medicine, but in the health service in general. Edinburgh University Medical School has a new um, programme taking in 30 medical students a year who have healthcare professional backgrounds. That starts 20 21 and will expand if that's successful. What that is doing is allowing people to study part-time so they can still work as a nurse, as a physio, as whatever their NHS job is, and they, they then study in the other half of the time. It's, it's done online, obviously, later years of that course they do need to be present for patient um, learning but we would hope that that attracts people who already know what it's like to work in the NHS who then stay and because they will be likely to be more mature the evidence is that they then don't leave the country so th those are very tangible practical uh, issues the second part of your question then was about I think some of this reliance on medical rotas. So there's a very traditional model of, of the medical consultant with registrars, doctors in training below, and another level of more junior doctor. What we actually realize that for a lot of those um, 
posts, in fact, other practitioners, in, in, in particular advanced nurse practitioners, do an extremely good job. They, there's, there's supervision there because the consultant is on call. And actually, this reliance on this needing to be a, a role for a doctor, we, we've, we've changed our attitude to that. So I know you know extremely well that the difficulties in pediatrics. You've also touched on psychiatry. Those are real shortage specialties. Uh, and so what we're doing is looking at providing services differently. So training advanced nurse practitioners in, um, in the uh, NHS in Grampian with, with the, uh, uh, Dr. Gray's hospital, advanced nurse practitioners are on a, a shortened course so that rather than taking two years, they're taking one year so that they can come into the service more quickly. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mira. I'd like to explore a few issues around governance and leadership. Um, in the report, there's a number of uh, references here to uh, the quality of board members, the lack of a consistent approach to achieving the appropriate level of knowledge and skills and expertise. Now, I believe the Scottish Government's uh, developing a range of initiatives in regard to that. In the light of the Auditor General's report, do you think that the initiatives that are being undertaken by the Scottish Government are adequate to address these issues? In, in response to some of the governance issues in NHS Highland, uh, we commissioned John Brown and Susan Walsh uh, to do a review of the governance there. They produced a report on that, which in turn produced a blueprint for all uh, NHS uh, boards in Scotland. Uh, that blueprint is now being applied to all boards and uh, is to be fully applied by the end of this financial year. So in other words, all boards should conform with the blueprint by the beginning of the next financial year. Uh, and that, that, I think, will respond to some of the issues that the Auditor General has raised. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, strengthened our support for induction of chairs and board members. Uh, and uh, I have, uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary has made clear to uh, the chairs of the board that she expects the findings uh, and good practice from that exercise done in NHS Highland to be applied in all boards. And that is something that we will uh, not simply take for granted, but we will follow up and assure ourselves about, Mr Beatty. The blueprint that you refer to, I don't think that's been shared with the committee, has it? I couldn't say if it has, but I can see no difficulty in doing so. I think it might be useful if we saw a copy of that and view our concerns over governance in general. Okay. Um, the initiatives, obviously you've used NHS Highland as, as an example, and here as a committee we only see when things go wrong, hmm. uh, not when they go right. How, how do you transfer best practice one board to another? Addressing problems is one thing, but actually adopting the good practice from boards that are getting it right well, is I think really valuable. I, <clears throat> I think that's part of the purpose behind this blueprint. We, we took the view that it wasn't sufficient simply for NHS Highland to learn the, the lessons of the review that, that John Brown and Susan Walsh did, but that, that these should be applied across Scotland. Um, again, we have uh, the Cabinet Secretary has raised directly with the chairs uh, of the health boards, the importance attached to not only understanding and sharing best practice, but actually implementing it, spreading and scaling it. Um, I have uh, discussed with uh, the board chairs the ways in which they can do that through the work that they're doing on, on innovation, because I, I think I would say to this uh, committee, Mr Beatty, that um, there are pockets of good practice, but we do need to get better at ensuring that they are embedded everywhere. That said, um, when issues uh, do arise, we, we, we try to learn from them, but we also um, make sure that, that we use the board chair meetings uh, to discuss um, the kinds of things that boards are finding to work well. So, for example, when um, NHS Lanarkshire went through a period of significant difficulty at the end of 2013, we put in um, a support team at that time, and the, the findings and learning from that support team were shared with all of the boards. Um, 
and I think the, some of the governance support that we now put in to boards, if they are experiencing difficulties, is drawn from the good practice we have learned from previous incidents. You're talking about NHS Lanark, Lanark 2013, yeah. and you shared that with yeah. the, the boards. Clearly, some of the boards didn't uh, learn from the lessons there, since we've had problems coming up subsequent to that. Well, and one of the things that um, we're committed to doing, and as I say, the Cabinet Secretary is leading, is to improve that sharing of best practice, to ensure that it's embedded everywhere, and that we assure ourselves that it is being embedded. Um, at that, that's what we're doing. Now, the blueprint itself obviously is something that boards can <coughs> use as a, as a, hopefully as a, a learning device, but the quality of NHS board members, as mentioned in the re report here, is very variable. And, uh, you know, again, we only see when things go wrong and frequently, not just in the NHS, frequently it's weaknesses on the board that have exacerbated the issues that have uh, arisen. Now, how, do you, how are you going to deal with that? The, the blueprint in itself won't address that. No. <coughs> so, um, in terms of recruiting board chairs, we have moved to, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the last year, to a process of values-based recruitment, which is much more thorough and detailed. So, it not only involves uh, a paper submission and an interview, um, but uh, uh, battery of psychometric tests conducted by someone who is qualified to do that, um, a, a role play exercise, again, can, uh, overseen by people who are qualified to do that. And from these elements of feedback, we get a much better picture of the skills and capacities of the individuals who are coming forward. And the Commissioner for Ethical Standards uh, uh, in Public Life in Scotland, who oversees the public appointments process, has uh, been um, very supportive of this uh, approach that we are now taking. Now, that is for chairs, Mr. Beattie. I, I, I want to be clear with the committee at this stage, but I do believe that there, there are elements of that that can also be applied to board member recruitment. And I further uh, am clear that the quality of the appraisal of board members needs to continue to improve in light of what we are uh, you know, are, are seeing. That said, I, I don't want to leave the committee with the impression that we don't have some very good um, board chairs and board members. We, we do, and I, mean, I, I, I engage with them directly, and the Cabinet Secretary engages directly with board chairs, as, as the committee knows. However, in paragraph 69, the Auditor General uh, talks about the need for a more effective challenge within the board members, and that has consistently been a weakness that we've seen in boards where things have gone wrong, or at least in, in NHS where things have gone wrong. How are you going to address the existing board members? So one of the things that I've been clear about when, when, when recommending chairs to the Cabinet Secretary for appointment is that I have to, uh, I take them through questioning on how they, they move from a process of seeking reassurance, which in my view is insufficient, to a process of assurance, which involves testing uh, the material that's put in front of them, ensuring that boards are not swamped with paper, but get the, get the information they need, and that they have the time and the skills um, to uh, interrogate that. So, um, again, now that when we're recruiting board members, we are paying very close attention to not only to the skills and capabilities that they bring, but also to the fit and mix in the board. So, in other words, we, we, we make sure that we've got people who are um, financially qualified. We, get, we make sure we have people who are able to scrutinise the clinical governance arrangements that are in place. So, so it's not just a, a baseline, every board member is the same, approach, but rather making sure that the fit and mix of the board is adequate for uh, the needs of the board in question. Thank you very much. And ask Sarwar. I want to return to, to workforce uh, for a moment and just some follow-up questions from the convener to Shirley Rogers and Dr Calderwood. Uh, Shirley Rogers, you, you said for the first time we have a workforce uh, plan published. Um, why is it taking 10 years and the current level of workforce challenges that we have for us to finally publish a workforce plan. And then when we did publish a workforce plan, 
rather than a comprehensive integrated plan to have three separate plans going back to the old model rather than the more modern model we want to project of the National Health Service and Social Care Service? So workforce planning has been present in the NHS. I've worked in the NHS in Scotland for 23 years. It's been workforce planning has been present for all of that time. Um, wh what became different was the elements that you've referred to. We are doing so with partners who are not just NHS partners. We're doing so in a manner that reflects the holistic nature of the NHS rather than just secondary care in the hospitals, primary care outside, just doctors, just nurses, just whatever. So the plan was published, as, you, you, as I know you know, in three phases that dealt with secondary care in the first instance, um, the integrated landscape with colleagues from COSLA and so on in the second instance, and then most latterly because of the negotiations around GMS contract and various other bits and pieces, primary care. It is our intention, as, as I think the committee is aware, to publish an integrated workforce plan and that work continues to be able to do so in the spring. That, that reflects that changing dynamic, which has not, been, has not been the case and wasn't the case 10, 15 years ago, where we did plan for specialty by specialties for doctors and as a separate thing, nursing, and as a separate thing, AHPs, and also. But, Was but the comprehensive plan not meant to be published this year? The comprehensive plan is due to, well, we, you've now, we, we have published the three elements of the plan as committed. The, um, the three separate plans, though, yes, based on the, based on the old model. Three separate, well, three separate plans based on the new methodology, um, and that was an, another important aspect. Was that in in order to be able to plan with multiple employers, we needed to have a so, shared. So methodology based on the, on the new it. plan, when do you think now that we have a new comprehensive plan coming, we will have a manageable vacancy rate in the National Health Service and Social Care Service? I, th I think the vacancy rate in the NHS and in social care is always going to be challenging for us. We're always going to have to continue to make sure that we have a sufficient supply. As you know, in numbers terms, health and social care in Scotland employs approximately 14% of the working population of Scotland. So in, in numbers of that size, there is always a challenge about making sure that that is that is influenced by other factors such as EU withdrawal, various other bits and pieces that, 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 that we need to consider. So there is always a challenge in making sure that that's the case. What, what we are doing, as the CMO has pointed out in the, in the previous evidence, is targeting those areas where we know that we have a specific challenge. So if I can give a challenge that isn't medical for a second, we know that we have a challenge around healthcare support. Yep. And in particular, those <coughs> individuals who work within the care home sector. So for the past two or three years, we've been developing an educational model which allows us to essentially have people learn while they learn. So, and, sorry. So, so to, to give you some medical examples, so we have 3,500 nurses and midwife vacancies, for example, in the National Health Service. One in three GP practices reporting a vacancy for a GP. Um, we have one in three radiologist posts vacant. We heard that from your Sharon Aaron and from Highlands. When will that be sorted? So based on your workforce, comprehensive workforce plan, when will we sort the radiologist issue? When will we sort the GP crisis issue? And when will we get down to 1,000 nurse vacancies rather than 3,500 nurse vacancies? So if I take the radiology example, some of that will be about recruitment. And as, and as you know, there's some targeted activity in that space. Some of it will also be about finding different solutions to some of those radiology challenges. So if I take the east of Scotland, for example, <coughs> and look at how radiology services are being developed there using digital and technical platforms that allow films to be read appropriately by clinicians from from every part of that region. It isn't simply a number. I think the Audit Scotland report says this is not just about money and supply. It is about transformation, how we use technology to, to better support some of those services that, that need to be supplied and are under pressure to do so. Frankly, a film can be read by a competent person in a number of different locations. That allows us to make the use of technology that we need to use. It also allows us to make good the supply issue. Can I, can I say to you specifically that in 5, 10, 15 years' time, we will never have a GP vacancy? No, I can't. And you, you know no, no, so just to clarify, I'm, I'm not saying never. At, at the moment, it's not sustainable. Health boards tell us that. It's not manageable. It's not managed at the moment. The vacancies is not managed at the moment. So at what point will we get to where we have a transformation plan around service 
and a workforce plan around find, filling the vacancies that gives us a manageable situation in our health boards. You can give us a time frame for that, surely. It, a it, year, two years, five years, ten years? I, I think it's going to be one of those things that is an incremental development. We, do, we now have a med medium-term financial framework that allows boards to plan. We have a number of issues around access that allows us to increase our supply. We look at training ratios, for example. So we know for those areas where we have a shortage supply, we are now training more than one for one. So in paediatrics, we train 1.6 for one. That reflects the changing patterns of work that people want to enjoy. People don't particularly necessarily all... You must have an ambition time. date. There must be an ambition. In terms of we hope to have it done by two years, five years, Mr. ten years. Uh, I think you've asked Ms Rogers this question a few times now and she's, she's given an answer. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Uh, the workforce issues are uh, hugely concerning, but all of these people need to work somewhere. And the report is quite clear that the capital, or discusses the capital investment that is required in the estate and talks about a backlog of maintenance of £900 million pounds worth. Uh, of which I think 45% is uh, urgent uh, or uh, significant or high risk. Uh, so first of all, what is the Scottish Government's response to this? And I mean, given the financial challenges that we've been looking at, how on earth is the NHS supposed to cover this? So <coughs> the, the, you're right, the level of backlog maintenance has, has stayed relatively static for the last few years. Um, so it's one of the factors that we look at in capital planning, um, but one of the most significant answers on backlog maintenance as well as making sure that um, the bu buildings are safe and able to be used is looking at our programme for replacement of facilities um, and look looking at as that as part of service redesign. So um, the, the answer on backlog maintenance is not to spend £900 million pounds, um, a, as a, a sum to bring those those facilities up to the level that you would want, the answer in some cases is always going to be um, some some additional facilities. So, so our capital investment strategy, longer term, is to look at the, the priorities across the country, um, and we've got a, a national infrastructure board to allow us to try to make sure that we prioritise across the whole of Scotland and not just um, focus on, on particular parts of of the country. Um, I think you, you know we said in the uh, in response to the report that we're developing just now a uh, um, capital investment strategy that will look much longer term. So we need to be able to look 10, 20 years um, in advance when we think about our, our infrastructure. As you know, a, a typical um, new hospital build will take around seven years from the very first um, case, strategic case that board makes through to actually being um, in, in use. So it's important that we, that we look much further ahead on that. Um, but our investment on an annual basis um, from capital is split between essential maintenance that we need across the service and investment in new in new facilities. And we've seen you know, recently the, the Newton Fries and Galloway Royal Infirmary is I think a good example of our answer on backlog maintenance in that particular situation. I, I hear the answer, Christy McLaughlin, but uh, I then look at paragraph 33 of the report, uh, which says, as the way healthcare is delivered changes, the existing NHS estate will need to adapt to reflect this. Mm. The Scottish Government has not planned what investment will be needed. Uh, and in, in your response there, you were talking about a capital investment strategy. This report seems to suggest to me that there is no such strategy, that the planning has not been done. Uh, has the Scottish Government really not planned what investment is going to be needed at all? Uh, and in any event, how, how can the NHS continue to deliver services in the future without the buildings and infrastructure to do so? So I, I agree. I, it's going to be one of the most significant areas for us to focus on over the next few years. Um, but Has it not been focused on already, Christine McLaughlin? So if you look at the number of new facilities that we've had over the last few years, you know, going back to the, the Queen Elizabeth, was £842 million investment in, in, in that facility. So it's not that we're, that we're not investing, but we always need to be looking ahead and make sure that we're making the right... Um, making use of those funds and, and prioritising correctly. So the work that we're doing just now is building on things like the, the regional plans to make sure that we're looking at the right facilities across the whole of the country. Um, I, I suppose it's a bit like Shirley Rogers was saying on workforce, it's not that things don't exist, um, but it's really important that we're able to look 
short term, medium term and long term. The strategy is really all about the, the very long term approach to that. Just let me be clear, the Scottish Government has not planned what investment will be needed. Is that a fair statement? Is that the case? Um, I, I know I, I, we, we, we haven't not planned, but we're doing work to make sure that the plans that we've got regionally for the next 20 years are, are in place. But the, the, the strategy that we're developing just now is a new strategy. So we, we do not have, I don't have a strategy just now to say to you, this is the one we've got just now for developing something for, for the future. When will it be developed? So we're, we're doing the work just now, and we've said that we'll have something published by the end of this financial year. Um, that, that so by, by April, approach. there'll be something that we that, presumably that's, can that's have a look at. we're working to. Splendid, thank you. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much. Can you, Peter, um, could you give us an idea if you've done any post-Brexit modelling on the workforce and its impact on <coughs> the NHS? Yes, we have. And, and what, what, what's the message that you're able certainly, to Certainly has been leading on that, and we'll, uh, we've, we've done quite significant work. Uh, and see, I will maybe be able to say more to you. So I'm sure around the table everybody will understand that the um, model that is emerging for Brexit is changing at a fairly frequent pace. Um, we had had a number of concerns around particular elements. So things like, for example, the mutual recognition of qualifications, whereby we needed to give consideration to whether or not arrangements would be um, in place to allow us to continue to deploy those people trained in EU 27 nations. We now have a position in respect of that. Um, we are currently operating the um, advanced pilot of the um, settled status scheme to allow those EU 27 workforce um, members of our NHS and health and social care staff to apply for that settled status. Um, and we understand that people are starting to do so. So our concerns about the immediacy of the workforce that we currently deploy, accepting that there are some messaging issues that have been raised with us and various other concerns that have been raised with us around um, circumstances that we may or may not find ourselves in, depending on the nature of the deal by which we withdraw from the EU. Um, those issues are largely... Um, I hope um, in a manageable form. The bigger issue for us at the moment is the concern around supply and future supply of people coming, choosing to come and study and live and work um, in the United Kingdom post-Brexit. Um, Chief Medical Officer has already identified that the strongest characteristic that encourages somebody to stay and practice medicine is where they went to university, where they went to medical school. So we know that there is a huge correlation, a very positive correlation between where you went to med school and when you, where you go on to practice. We are now starting to see some of those numbers and expressions of interest in medical places there start to dip a wee bit. Um, committee members will be aware that we have now seen the number of applications from EU 27 nations to join the, medical, uh, the Nursing and Midwifery Council significantly decline. So we know that if we went from approximately 8,000 to less than 100 applicants to the NMC register um, in the last year. So there are issues around supply which are encouraging us to work very hard to try and grow our own, which is why some of the issues that Catherine talked about in terms of medicine are similarly replicated with extra effort around nursing, schools of nursing, and in particular around healthcare support workers where we know that the proportion of EU nationals working in the healthcare, um, health, healthcare support worker network is higher, that we are working very closely with colleagues in local government and in the other sectors to try and make sure that we've got a supply pipeline in that respect too. So there is um, a, a, a concerted effort to try and make sure that we are able to retain those EU national citizens who already work within our system to um, assure them that they are very much wanted to continue in that space and that the messaging around that is positive and to look at the supply pipeline going forward. Willie Coffey. What's the, what do you think the likely impact will be on NHS staffing and recruitment from the £30,000 salary limit announced yesterday in the new immigration policy? Well, we know that £30,000 as a cut-off point will um, 
will impact on um, some of our nursing grades in terms of it will also impact on some of our junior doctors, but the biggest um, proportionate hit is in that healthcare support worker um, arrangement. So, so we, that that is a, a a challenge to us, and of course, um, you know, the narrative about low pay does not necessarily also indicate low skill. So, healthcare support workers may not be paid very much, but actually, the skills and abilities that they bring are critically important to to how we how we run our social care programs. When I, when I sat in the committee a number of years ago, when uh, Caroline Gardner's predecessor, Robert Black, was here, he warned us about these days facing the NHS and how difficult it would be to, st to sustain and deliver the service as it currently was. We're, we're seeing more boards reporting overspends, the numbers increasing, and the size of those overspends are, are increasing too. And this is despite record funding for the NHS and another £730 million going in next year. My question is, where are we with the transformation strategy that we're kind of pinning our hopes on? How consistent is it across Scotland? And when will we begin to see some of these overspend numbers coming down because of the benefits of the transformation strategy taking place? I'll bring others in, but um, I want to, to draw out three things. First of all, um, <clears throat> the Ministerial Steering Group has commissioned a, a, a review of health and social care integration. Uh, Sally Loudon and I are co-chairing the group, uh, which will be reporting to the Ministerial Steering Group on uh, this in January of uh, 2019. And one of the uh, key impetuses behind that is to accelerate the pace of change through health and social care integration and to pick up the points that Mr Vitti and others have made uh, earlier about sharing uh, and implementing best practice. So uh, that's part one. Part two, uh, I think it would be useful for um, the Chief Medical Officer to say a little about uh, the work that she's taking forward through the Realistic Medicine Programme, because that, again, is, is genuine um, and sustainable change, which will make a difference to the way in which um, we engage with uh, patients and the way in which um, uh, uh, diagnosis and treatment is done. Um, I know that, for example, just recently, um, and Shirley Rogers may be able to say a little more about this, um, we're seeing a reduction uh, in, in the rate of prescribing through the work that we're doing uh, with, with uh, pharmacists and patients to ensure that there is uh, appropriate prescribing, that people are not um, having, um, uh, well, it's called polypharmacy, too many medicines. So we can cover these points off if the committee would like. Okay. Dr Catherine Calderwood, your take on transformation, is it going far enough, fast enough even? So the, so the realistic medicine um, that, that we are promoting has been has started in Scotland and is, is now all over the, the world, talking to people about what they actually want from their medicine. So just because we can do doesn't mean that that's the right thing. And for, for somebody, somebody may want to run a marathon, somebody else may just want to be able to walk their dog in their garden. So there, there is a, a, a real shared decision-making and personalised approach to people's care that we probably haven't refined as well as we should have done. But within that, what we need is, is, is talking about value-based healthcare. So that's of value to the person. But what we also need is, is value for the money of the public purse. So for the first time, and we believe we're the first country in the world to do this, we have a training programme which matches clinicians and people from the finance department of their health board to learn together about what we're value improvement training. So that, that it, it may sound... I think it does sound naive when I say out loud that we uh, uh, there, there isn't an understanding about the finances that, is, that goes through what doctors learn in their training. We, we know then that people in finance are working on a, on a different column of numbers. So we, we have brought that together as something that then will spread. So we will train 200 people this year, have trained 200 people this year in the first year, and we, we have funding then to continue that training. And you can imagine that um, uh, small numbers of people in the boards then train others. So we, we're working also on exposing where there's variation in practice. So variation in practice, which leads to variation in outcomes. So we have at the moment a, a rate of primary hip replacements, so first hip replacements across Scotland that varies by a factor of uh, fourfold. Primary knee replacements vary by a factor of sevenfold across Scotland. So the patients, I'm telling you, don't vary by that factor. 
So it may be that there are some people actually having procedures that they don't need. And it may also be in other areas people are not having what they, what they should have. So we're, we're, we've, pr we've published three maps of variation in, in Scotland, and we're planning to publish another 10 by the end of this financial year. And what this is doing is it's, it's asking the questions. I, I'm not going to tell the orthopaedic surgeons how many knee replacements they should be doing. But what it's, it's exposing is why is their practice in, 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 in this small country so different? And we, we're looking at child, rates of childhood obesity, uh, and, and, and the, the clinical communities, doctors uh, I'm talking about, but it's actually right across all the healthcare professionals are really welcoming this because actually these are the conversations they want to have. And, and they often talk to me about having not had, felt they've had permission to talk in this way to people. And I, I will be brief, but I must mention the citizens' jury. So the first ever citizens' jury in Scotland has, been, has just finished. Uh, we invited people uh, over the age of 16 to come together in three weekends to talk about some of these very difficult questions that we're doing. We were a victim of our own success, so we calculated the number of people we would need to invite based on voting and, and how many people turn up for ordinary uh, juries. And we um, were oversubscribed by 50%. We had to turn people away because they, they wanted to be part of it. Uh, I have seen a draft of the recommendations that the people of Scotland have come up with, and, and they are really supportive of these difficult questions about value, about values, and about improving how we're actually delivering our health care. And, and this will not be quick, but I think we have started the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bill Bowman. Thank you. Convenient. Uh, can we come back to the question of um, locums and uh, the costs there? One of the issues when we were discussing it was that we speak about agencies, but I'm not sure I or others know very much about these agencies. I mean, you know, who are they? Are they um, regulated? Do you approve them? How do you manage your buying power so that perhaps the boards here and, and the rest of the UK are not just having a bidding war and pushing up the cost for the same people um, to, to nobody's benefit? Okay, I'll bring I'll bring Shirley in on that in a second. I think it, it so <clears throat> it's probably just worth saying to the committee that medical agency spend in NHS boards fell by five percent between 2016-17 and 2017-18, and locum spend fell by ten percent between 2016 and 2017-18. And the reason I make that point, Mr. Bowman, is that. Um, while there are high costs that the board has, the, uh, the committee has quite rightly drawn attention to, we are working hard to bear down on this, not just to let it uh, run away from us. And um, the the use of locums is 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 really quite important. I, I don't want to reopen the point about about Highland, but the, the two locums in question were in um, the Belford Hospital and and, and in in in. Uh, in the Caithness Hospital in Wick, so these were not large hospitals that could that could flex their workforce um, particularly easily. It might be different in a you know in a in a big hospital, and the local community, as the CMO said, would have had to travel um, quite substantial distances had these services not been available, um, and in particular, uh, given that uh, the types of skills uh, possible impact on emergency surgery as well, but. Um, Shirley, you might say something about the way in which the medical agency staffing is operated. Please, Ms Rogers. Indeed. So, agencies, the, there is no um, reason for us to be concerned about the quality of the people who come to us from the agencies. They are run through a commercial organisations. They contract with boards. There is a national contract that is used that is regulated. No, there are there are a number of them. There are a number of them. In roughly, I'd probably say in regular usage, four to six. So not thousands, but regular. There is a distinction between that and a bank, which is the NHS's mm -hmm. own staff run in in that space. So I don't have anything that would suggest to me that there are concerns about the quality of what we get, though clearly. All of our ambition is to try and have full establishments and to use our bank where possible. The point that I would make, perhaps more bluntly than the Director General has, is that in the utilisation of these agencies, we, we do so in order to preserve safety for patients. 
And just, that, just finally, my point was really, how do you manage the relationship so that you, know, you are in control? You're a large purchaser, I expect. You would ex I, I would think then that you have some sway over them and, and setting the rates. There, there, is a, there is a national prototype contract which is supplied from NSS to the boards for their use. They're not required to absolutely adhere to it, but there is a national protocol contract that, that, that they can draw on if they wish to. Forgive me, uh, witnesses, I'm still not completely sure I, I follow this issue about locums. Why would a doctor take an NHS contract if you can make £400,000 going through an agency to work in NHS Highland? Well, security of tenure, um, uh, views about their uh, their values, the desire to work in one place and be certain about it, um, the fact that uh, you, you can settle your family in a particular place if you have certainty about the length of your employment. Um, there are you know there are there are there are many reasons uh, why a person might choose to. Uh, uh, not just in, in medicine, but in many professions, choose to go for a, a, a locum or agency type employment or to go for fixed uh, and um, substantive employment with an employer. And we know that there are many people that do, but the fact that the locum and agency option is open and working and thriving in Scotland means that they have an option. Mr Gray, does the power not rest with the Scottish Government to close this option down and to save the taxpayer a lot of money with the same service? The power rests with us to close it down. We could close every contract and we could cease to employ locums tomorrow and I would not like to estimate the number of people who might die as a result. I think it would be a very dangerous thing to do. I accept, convener, I accept wholeheartedly your point about the expense of some of this and the importance of bearing down on that. I've tried to give the committee some evidence that we are seeking to bear down on it. But as Ms Rogers has said, and I'm sure the CMO will support me, there are significant patient safety issues at stake here. If we take someone out of the Belford Hospital, it is not a big hospital. If we take people out of WIC, um, the, 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 the good folk of Wick are not going to want to have to travel Mr. down Gray, Berrydale with respect, Bridge. I'm not suggesting, and I've already made that clear, you take the doctors out. I'm suggesting that the NHS Scotland, as the main employer for doctors in Scotland, manages their workforce and makes sure that these hospitals have doctors that they need. Because clearly these doctors exist, but the option is open to go through an agency rather than an NHS contract. And that may be a lifestyle choice, it may be a point in career choice. But you've left that choice open to them. Indeed we have, and I believe we should continue to do so. I'm happy to say that unequivocally to the committee. Okay, can I uh, turn to paragraph 62 in the Auditor General's report? It talks about leadership, and she's got three, four, five, six, uh, six bullet-pointed examples of... Um, arrangements at the top of boards where there have been struggles, struggles to recruit both chief executives and directors of finance. There have been various uh, interim positions, um, a high turnover of non-executive members of boards as well. Do we have enough people to, to run our health boards? We have a chief executive in place in every health board um, and at the moment... Some of them interim, is that correct? Mr. So the chief executive of NHS Grampian is an interim position and we took the decision, and I think it was the right one, uh, to appoint a new chair because Professor Logan is leaving at the end of this year to appoint a new chair and to allow the chair to oversee the recruitment of the new Chief executive, the substantive recruitment of a chief executive. I think that was the right decision. Um, we have uh, recruited to the state hospital. Uh, Shirley, do you want to give a, a list of the places? I mean, I can do it, or Shirley can well, do it. I mean, the yeah. Auditor General's yeah. done it for us very yeah. helpfully. I think. I think my policy question is: How do we get people in place that are there for the long term to run our services? Because this is 
a kind of hodgepodge of interim and struggling to recruit. It's paragraph 62. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm reading it, and what I'm saying to you is that um, we, have a, we now have a substantive appointment in NHS Orkney. We have a substantive appointment and have had for some time in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. We have a substantive appointment to the Golden Jubilee National Hospital. Um, so, you know, the, the point in time at which this, the Auditor General wrote this report, what she said was entirely factually accurate. The fact is that we have moved on since then. Thank you. Do members have any further questions for our witnesses this morning? And ask Sarwa. Thank you, Chair. I, I had some um, questions for, for, for Mr Gray. Um, Paul, I, I've uh, got to thank you, first of all, for the last two and a half years. You've been very open. We've had our fair share of friendly arguments and discussions, but you've always been very open, and um, I want to wish you all the very best for, for the future. I, I, I want to take advantage of you being here and maybe ask you a couple of questions now that perhaps you might be less on the leash in terms of some of the uh, issues, but being the consummate public, um, civil servant, perhaps you'll still be uh, able to bat them off. But if I can clarify, Mr. Starbar, I'm, I'm expecting Mr. Gray to be back again before he escapes the Scottish Government. Uh, and we look forward to it. But, but just a, a couple of points related to what we've discussed today. Miss um, Mara said about the number of people um, relating to um, health boards. Going back to the vacancy rate, the fact that we have 3,500 nurses, 900 GPs, etc., we're over 5,000 people short in the National Health Service. Um, should we just be honest with the public and say we're not going to find 5,000 people? And given the fact we're not going to find 5,000 people, we need to change the model of our care and there being a real programme of reform coming from here, from the government, led by the government. Um, would you advocate that? Do you support that? Well, I think that we have... Um, there has been significant investment in primary care announced. I think we should al we should allow that to take uh, to take its course. Um, that has that's 250 million announced over five years. We, there has been an announcement about 800 additional um, mental health workers. I think we should allow that to take its course. Um, I think that there is an international shortage of radiologists. There isn't actually something. Uh, you know, we can do that prevents an international shortage, but as Ms Rogers had said, we don't uh, absolutely need uh, to have everything done by radiologists. They're highly skilled individuals. There are other opportunities for others to participate. Technology can make a difference. Um, overall, st staffing levels are up. I mean, I can, I can give you the detailed numbers, but there have also, in the last quarter, been a reduction in the vacancy rates for consultants, nursing and midwifery and EHPs, so we are seeing that coming down. Um, and I, I, I don't make this up as a, just a flippant point, I make it as a genuine one. The 140,000 whole time equivalent staff who work in the NHS did not come from nowhere. They came from the workforce planning that we have done. We have substantially enhanced that, as Ms Rogers has said. I, I accept that, Mr Gibb. I'm asking a different question, <laughs> um, which is not to say um, uh, and I accept all yeah. the things you've said around those uh -huh. um, recruitment yeah. challenges and, and what you've done to counter those recruitment challenges. I'm asking a, a much more broader point. Does there need to be an acceptance that we aren't going to magic 5,000 people, that there does need to be a radical transformation in how we deliver services in Scotland, and that leadership needs to come from the Scottish Government setting out radical reforms and a new model of care that takes this Parliament and, more importantly, the public and the people that work in our National Health Service with us. Does that need to happen? There are. So, nobody is disputing that there needs to be radical change. Nobody is disputing that in any way whatsoever. The changes in the last few years, and I'm, I'm not making a point about particular terms of office or terms of parliament. The I'm just saying the way that things have developed ha has been substantial. There are people now being cared for at home that wouldn't have been cared for at home 10 years ago. There are people being treated in different ways. If you go to the Golden Jubilee National Hospital, you will see them having um, supported uh, discussions with patients where you have a nurse at one end and a, and a doctor at the other to make sure that people are, are, are appropriately cared for and treated so they don't have to come back from Orkney after they've had their surgery. We're, we are making significant advances. I expect the, the, the future to be very different from today in the same way as today is very different from 10 years ago. Thank you very much. Do any other members have further points for the panel? Can I thank you very much indeed for your evidence this morning. I now close the public session of this meeting.